All right, the Rhodesian Bush War Part 2, the United Nations, Katanga, and Biafra. So in this video, I'm going to talk about the United Nations role in nation building, or as I like to call it, third wave imperialism. Um, the short-lived and the short-lived nations of Katanga, which was an independent state in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and then uh, Biafra, which was a, um, a country that attempted to form uh, inside Nigeria. So after World War II, uh, the United Nations was largely seen as a joke. Um, it really, much like the League of Nations, it couldn't accomplish anything. It, it was... Nobody took it seriously. I mean, it was put in place to stop another world war, but it, it, there was no way it was ever going to accomplish this. So these people that were running the United Nations decided uh, that they were going to sort of start making examples. And they looked to sub-Saharan Africa. Now, if you remember in our last video, we left off in the 1960s, Rhodesia just declared independence. South Africa had declared independence in the uh, the early 60s. And pretty much every other country in sub-Saharan Africa is either having a civil war, a communist revolution, or a famine at this time. Sub-Saharan Africa, this is the, the decades where sub-Saharan Africa earned its reputation for brutality and heartbreak, basically. So the United Nations looks at this and goes, you know what, these are... This is a place where we can push our agendas um, and we can go in here and we can build up some of these nations and stabilize them. So they decide, first basically, they set their eyes on um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now, they had pretty much just wrapped up their civil war and had formed... Uh, this this Congo sort of confederation of states under a uh, a, a democratically elected president. And now, when I say democratically elected president, I mean he paid enough people to vote for him that he was able to take power. Um, he was actually assassinated pretty quickly, <laughs> and you're going to find that a lot. So Katanga was part of this uh, confederation in the Congo. And this newly elected president decided that he was going to take the mineral wealth of the country and nationalize it. And a lot of people were not happy with this because that essentially takes all of the profits from all this stuff and redirects it back into the government, which is then in theory supposed to use those profits to provide for the people, but that's not how it ever, ever, ever works. So this region in Katanga, which was one of the more mineral rich areas in the Congo, specifically with uranium, and I'm going to get into why that's very, very important now, because we've got the Cold War going on, we have an arms race. Uranium is essential to nuclear bombs at the time. The Russians see this nationalization and they immediately move into the country um, and start making deals with these folks for uranium. Katanga decides that, that they don't want any part of this and they secede. It's fairly peaceful. Um, Katanga does its own thing. You know, there's some squabbles between various government troops. It's not really that big a deal. Um, the, the president of the, the Democratic uh, Republic of Congo has a lot on his plate. And uh, he, it's not a big deal. The United Nations views this and goes, ha, this is our fucking chance. And they send troops in to suppress the Katangan Revolution and prevent it from seceding from the rest of the country so that we can say, ha ha, we're the United Nations and we can do stuff. <laughs> this does not go so well. The United Nations troops storm into the country like the fucking Gestapo 
they murder, they rape, they shoot children, women. It turns into a genocide. Katanga, the government, responds by hiring uh, Belgian and French mercenaries who are World War II veterans and sends them into the fray in defense. The United Nations uh, responds by saying that's a, an illegal act, mercenaries aren't legal, and uses an excuse to send more troops in this process. A school is bombed by UN troops. Um, a pro-Katanga radio station is raided. The people are rounded up by the United Nations troops brought out into the street and executed. <laughs> And uh, if you, that this is a really sort of small version of, of what happened there in Katanga. Of course, the United Nations eventually, after all of this bloodshed, succeeded in reuniting the country, which then immediately made deals and exported all their uranium to the Soviet Union. So there's a lot that was going on between the lines there. You'd think that the United Nations at the time wouldn't want to benefit the Soviet Union having nuclear weapons, but like I said, if you get an opportunity... Um, Look up, Google Google the um, the phrase "Remember Katanga," um, and there's some good information that's going to pop up, and uh, you can read more into this. I could honestly do a whole video on Katanga. Um. So now, mind you, Rhodesia is right to the south of this, watching all of this take place. Say hi, Zabu. She likes history too. Next, you have uh, Nigeria. Nigeria has a couple of separate ethnic populations, like most countries do. There's a particular population, and I cannot remember the name of them, but they were um, oppressed by, by the uh, people who were in power in Nigeria. And so they decide that they're going to secede and form their own country, Biafra. They have no military. They really have no money. So they do the same thing. They hire some uh, Belgian mercenaries. And, and what's interesting about this is now they don't hire these Belgian mercenaries. These Belgian mercenaries essentially volunteer because they believe in what's going on down here. And they're seeing these people get systematically, intentionally starved by their own government. So when they secede, a lot of these Belgian mercenaries who are fighting in the Congo... They volunteer and they form uh, commando battalions, like in the, the Boer term, commando with a K. Small, mobile, special units. Um, and they fight a pretty good damn war against the uh, Nigerian government. And you'd think that that... this I, I rarely get into this whole bad guys and good guys thing when it comes to history, because a lot of times you find that there just isn't bad guys and good guys. Everybody's just a, kind of a dick and... In this case, these, these Biafrans were the good guys. These Belgian mercenaries were the good guys. And the Nigerians and later the United Nations were absolutely 100% the bad guys. The United Nations sends troops in to capture these mercenaries. They disarm the Biafrans and they stand back and actively facilitate what turned into the greatest one of the the largest scale mass starvations in history. The Nigerian government starved millions of people to death um, for attempting to revolt because they were tired of getting shit on by their own government. And the United Nations facilitated this. So now this was, of course, right to the... Um, right to the, uh, the west of, Niger or of, of uh, Rhodesia. So while that's going on, the United Nations is actively facilitating genocide. You have communist revolution, you have civil war, and then you have Rhodesia. Rhodesia is a peaceful country. Its dollar at one point was valued higher than the British pound and the uh, American dollar. That's how good they were doing. So they declare independence. And that's when the uh, things really picked up in Rhodesia. Um, 
remember I was talking my, my buddies there, the Zanla and the Zipra, the uh, the two communist factions that were fighting in Rhodesia against the government and against each other. Each one was backed by a, a separate communist power. I believe Zipra was China and Zanla was uh, the USSR. The Soviet Union notices that now the United Nations, because they declared independence instead of deciding that they're going to go along with this hippy-dippy government bullshit that the UN is pushing as code for we want to control your government in this sort of third wave imperialism. Third wave imperialism um, is the United Nations going around and building up these little tin pot dictators so that they can have moral high ground, or so they say, and have access to all the resources produced by these countries. It's no different than um, than colonial imperialism. It's no different than the, the shit that went on during World War II. It's, it's imperialism. It's just... Uh, same, same shit, different name. So the United Nations uh, puts sanctions in place against Rhodesia because they won't let everyone vote unless they're a landowner. And uh, the USSR and China recall a lot of these uh, Zipra and Zanla guys and put them through these intensive training camps. There was actually um, Zipra fighters that were trained in Pyongyang, North Korea. <laughs> um, a lot of these guys went to Cuba. Um, they worked directly throughout the war with Cuban and North Korean um, military advisors. There was Cuban boots on the ground in Rhodesia, uh, mining roads, attacking uh, farm families, bombing government buildings. So Rhodesia is realizing that they're going to have to really do something. They have an arms embargo, a trade embargo. They need weapons. They need to build up their military. So they go out to um, their buddies down in South Africa. Um, South Africa is uh, willing to export them arms and equipment and so on and so forth. Uh, Israel, believe it or not, um, being sympathetic to the idea of being surrounded by hostile states, uh, decides to bail them out. They send them uh, Galil rifles. They send them helicopters, a whole bunch of stuff. And the UN, of course, really can't tell Israel what to fucking do. I mean, they've tried for a long time. Israel doesn't give a fuck about the UN. <laughs> so things are escalating in the country. Around the same time here now, we're getting into the mid-60s. Um, you remember in my uh, Vietnam War video, of course, America is now fully involved in fighting communist guerrillas in Vietnam. Rhodesia takes notice of this, and they take notice of the tactics. At this time, you had the 1st of the 9th Air Mobile Division, was the most one of the most successful um, units in um in Vietnam, and it was uh, the idea was uh, you took troops, put them in a shitload of helicopters, and they would just hop from battle to battle all around the country. And uh, it really worked quite well against these guerrilla warfare tactics, because uh, you know the idea of guerrilla warfare was you would um, instigate conflict, harass, break contact, retreat. When the enemy became complacent, you would attack. And now these Americans, they would send out these little um, search and destroy patrols. The communists would see, you know, a platoon of guys or whatever in the woods and go, hey, that's easy pickings, attack them. And then all of a sudden they have, you know, 15, 20 helicopters full of uh, air cab up their ass. <laughs> and then on top of that, you know, close air support, um, artillery, um, everything you can imagine in the for a while, I mean, in Vietnam, this was working. We were quite successful. Um, so Rhodesia takes a look at this, and they decide that they're going to organize their COIN, which stands for Counterinsurgency uh, Counterinsurgency Operations. So I can't remember what the hell it stands for. So they decide they're going to organize their COIN troops around this. When I say coin, just I'm talking about counterinsurgency ops. I'm not. I don't remember what the hell it stands for. Um, they set out their security forces in traditional fashion. The security forces spread out across the country. Um, 
you know, they keep eyes, they do patrols, they do these sort of sweeping clear missions that the Americans were doing. And then they have their, their ace, which is the Rhodesian Light Infantry. Um, and this is something I've, I've been really into for a long time because they really revolutionized this counterinsurgency warfare. Essentially, they, it was made up of elite infantry that were helicopter born, very similar to the uh, American Air Cab. But what these guys did were they operated in small four man teams called sticks. And how a fire force operation worked was you had your intel on the ground and you had your guys on the ground. And when they made contact with a terrorist element inside the country, they would call back and these guys would be on a helicopter, you know, on their way in a matter of minutes. So you had three or four of these four man sticks. They would land in the helicopter. They would harass the enemy into engaging them. Once the enemy engaged them, they would call in close air support now that they had the enemy's exact position and they would wipe them out. And this was incredibly effective, significantly more so than the American Air Cav, anything we did in Vietnam. We ended up uh, taking a lot of these principles and applying them to later coin operations that the United States was involved in. We even had uh, Rhodesian Um, after the country fell, uh, military advisors working directly with us to to train us how to do this because they, nobody did this better than the Rhodesians and and really nobody since. Um, I mean, this is one of the few countries in in history that's actually won against a guerrilla war. So (laughs) that'll tell you something. So these tactics are successful. Um, Rhodesia is slowly getting beaten down by this constant pressure from the rest of the world. People are going on TV calling them racist. They're calling the soldiers, uh, you know, like the Gestapo, like they're going out there and murdering, you know, based on race. Another thing that's been lost to history is that the Rhodesian army was 100% volunteer and it was 80% black. It reflected the population of the country. These guys... You know, they volunteered to defend their country regardless of color. They thought that they were fighting against communist terrorists. They were not fighting against any sort of race or creed. Um, I mean, you got to imagine this this idea you have in your head of Rhodesia where it's a white soldier killing a black guy when it was really a black soldier killing a Cuban advisor. (laughs) Something you need to take into account. That happened multiple times. That was the... That's the uh, the takeaway from Rhodesian, the Rhodesian combat. Black soldiers killing Cubans, Chinese, North Koreans, and their local guerrilla counterparts. So, this war progresses. It continuously gets bigger and bigger. As more countries around Rhodesia fall to communism, Mozambique finally oust the Portuguese communists take hold, more and more troops start pouring into Rhodesia from these communist-backed dictatorships that are surrounding the country. At this point, there's full trade and arms embargoes. Rhodesia is suffocating. And I mean, why? You know? Anyway. So, finally... In ni- the, so this goes on throughout the entirety of the 70s. Rhodesia is largely successful. There's a couple of big cross-border raids to take out large terrorist camps. The, they're winning the war, but they're slowly losing the population. These people are tired of being the world's pariah. So in 1979, Rhodesia says, you know what? We will hold open elections. Everybody in the country can come vote. Here's the date. Um, We've had enough. We want to put an end to this war. If this will put an end to the fighting, we'll do it. So the United Nations rushes in. British officials rush in. You know, people from all around the country get together. They all go to the polls and they vote. And guess who gets reelected? The apartheid government under Ian Smith. He wins in a landslide. 
There was no gerrymandering at this time. There was no, you know, influence. There was no, there was threats and things at the polls, but not on behalf of Smith's government. He wins in a landslide. And that's another thing that's been lost to history. The United Nations and the British government and the communists are so pissed at the outcome of this, they actually threaten Rhodesia with military force to make them have a second election right after this one because they didn't like the outcome. Think about that. The British government, the United Nations, they starved this country, allowed them to get repeatedly attacked by terrorists in the name of them not having democracy. And then when they do and they don't like the outcome, they force a second election. Except this time they have thugs on the ground. United Nations, communist, British government thugs go in there and they stuff the boxes, they threaten the populace, they kidnap people. And um, a government under um, Mugabe, who was the leader of uh, Zanla, barely inches in there and wins the, um, the presidency of uh, Rhodesia. And um, that's where things go very, very wrong for that region. And um, I'm going to have to make a separate video on that. So I'm skipping over a whole lot here. Um, and that's because I really don't have a choice. This thing would be like three or four hours long. But if you have any questions about uh, Biafra, Katanga, or sort of these more specifics to a Rhodesian fire force operation or Rhodesian military operations or, uh, you know, even if you want me to get into specific battles or anything like that, I can do that. So um, if you have any of those questions, feel free to ask. And uh, thanks for uh, hanging in there and listening to me rant.